Good morning to all the hundreds of you who managed to wake up. Uh, Saturday morning here in Toronto, we're at Astro. So, uh, yeah, no, this is a great con. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting people back here. This has been you know, actually a pretty intense convention. So and uh, we got here um, Thursday night. I've never met Mercedes last night. And she was telling us about her parents. She has 14 parents. Someone in the green room has nine cats, and I was suggesting that they have a convention where they bring your pet to a convention day, where all the all the folks end up uh, end up bringing their pets here. So that might be something conventions should think of doing. Instead of bringing your dog to work out, you bring your cat, your bird, your dog constrictor. I have an extremely cute dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but. But I do have to admit that I got nervous when I got invited to Ad Astra again because of what happened the last time I was at Ad Astra. I, I, was, I was here in 2000, I was invited to be the other guest of honor at Ad Astra, and then a week before I was to be here at the magazine, and I was dead and was canceled. So I ended up throwing away my prepared remarks and speech I was going to give, which I no longer know what that speech was going to be, and instead spent an hour complaining and bitching and cursing the publisher. And, uh, explaining how the magazine was born and how it died and so forth. So when they invited me to come again, I thought, well, gee, the last time I got invited to Ad Astra, I lost my job. Uh, is this a trend? Is this what happens when you get invited to Ad Astra? Well, you would also so, think that the people lots here, they could have their share of negativity. That's that true. That that's true. He has <laughs> absorbed all the negativity into himself. God bless Peter Watts. But, uh, so basically what this means is if I go home and I still have my job in the month, then I won't blame Ad Astra, and I'll be able to come to a third one someday. So tell us about your life right now, because other than seeing you on occasions like this, I have no clue what you're up to. Oh, no clue so, what I'm up to. So what is well, your life like? Well, I have an extremely bifurcated life, and uh, my day job, I work for the Sci-Fi Channel, news site called Blaster, which covers movies, TVs, you know, books, games, etc., etc. And then with the other half of my brain, I write my own fiction. So, so how does this break down time? Is it a full-time job? Or oh, it is very, it is most definitely a full-time job. It's not a full-time job. Because if at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, you know, someone announces uh, on Saturday night, we've just hired the lowest lane to be Superman. You've got to get a story up immediately. Because you want to be up before all your competitors post that story. And they say, oh, we'll wait until tomorrow morning to post it. Then people will learn, uh, well, we'll go to the site that gets enough meeting. So luckily, I have some very good freelancers who have their eyes open and they're listening for that news. But it's not like a print magazine. When I edit a print magazine, you can take a deep breath and say, oh, the issue's going to bed. Don't have to worry until four weeks from now, whatever. Next magazine has to be. If something happens immediately after you've gone to press, well, okay, we, we missed it. There now is no such thing as the magazine closes down and we've gone to press. So if something happens, if someone famous dies, et cetera, et cetera, you have to cover it immediately. So it is a, you know, basically a 24-7 news cycle kind of thing. I've been working for the Sci-Fi Channel for almost 11 years now, editing online magazines. And it's just become more intense in terms of uh, the way things are done. Originally, the thing I was hired to edit was called Science Fiction Weekly. And the concept of, concept of a weekly in internet time, I mean, that's like putting out an annual or you know, a book every 10 years or something like that, that, that people want it daily. And even something daily isn't enough, because doing it once, people want to come multiple times a day and see something new added every time. So yeah, that part of my life is. I remember yeah. covering my engagement to David, and he published with my this picture of David and I in competing extremely loud clothes. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was in 1995. 19, no, no, 1996. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been uh, boy, right when it started. Because I took over in the year 2000. It was started uh -huh. 
August 15, 1995 was the first issue of Science Fiction Weekly. So I guess we were in the first, two, yeah. the first two months. Yeah. I, guess, I guess we were. Um, so what's the most fun you've had in the last year? Well, the most fun in the last year was I had two short story collections published. Unless you mean the most fun and the, you know, the most fun in the sci-fi town. No, no, I mean, I, I mean, really fun. <laughs> oh well, you know, let's see, what's the most fun? The last twelve months, I'm trying to remember. Well, I mean, completely outside of science fiction, we had a world con and going. Well, it's not outside of science fiction because there was a world con involved in going to Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, Australia and New Zealand are cool. But you know, yeah. that was a lot of fun. But, yeah, you know, the um, thing. I, I went opal shopping in Peru. Oh, well, we're off. We're yeah, off. yeah. David taught at the Australian Clarion. I really liked Australia. I got off the plane. David was went there uh, a few days earlier than me because he had to go be there on a particular day, and the airplane flights got cheaper about two days later. And so I flew to Australia and New Zealand with an infant mm. by myself, oh. which is a much better experience than it sounds like because Qantas was wonderful. <laughs> and, Anyway, so I got there, I'd lost my voice. I'd been on the plane, I'd been in transit for, I don't know, all 36 hours, 27 hours, something like that. And I started walking around and started looking at him and said, David, what voice I have left? Can we move here? <laughs> well, did you do New Zealand before Australia? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, after. that, that well, that was sort of our misfortune as well, because while, we, while the Australian World Con was going on, an earthquake hit New Zealand. And the southern island of New Zealand was devastated. So luckily, well, for us, we didn't have a hard trip. We were going to wing it once we got to New Zealand, so we didn't have to suddenly cancel all our reservations for the South Island. We were planning to do both islands. And they did not need tourists while this disaster was going on in the South Island. So the, the folks who, on the way to Australia, did New Zealand first had the free reign of, of both islands. But the rest of us who did it the other direction missed out on a lot of fun. And, I think my, my, my sort of most intense memory of New Zealand, I mean, there was lots of pretty scenery and so on, but, you know, we were tooling around in a rental car, and we were trying to get from one side of the North Island to the other side of the North Island, and there was this, like, line on the map that, was, that we got from the rental car agency, but it was a different color than the other lines, and, but it was really direct. And so, and, and you know, we drove in that direction, and there was just one sign, you know, about this big, and it had an exclamation point on it. And we didn't have any particular clue what that meant, and then about, oh, two or three miles later, the pavement ended, and we were driving through, you know, wild, wild forest on this mud road and these switchbacks going further and further and further, and, then, and it was, you know, Kind of scary, but it, but, but it was also really, really beautiful. And we get to the other end, and eventually we noticed that what that color road meant, meant on the rental car map is that was where you were not allowed to oh. take the rental car. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we, we survived, but if it had been a little rainier or something, we would have probably been thrown off the edge and nobody would have ever found that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so it was, I mean, on the one hand, I really didn't understand quite how much trouble we were in, but by the time we understood that, uh, it was too late. You know, we figured we must be as far across the country as we could go. Well, so what's the most exciting thing you've done in the last year? Oh, I don't know that that was it, but. That, well, no, that was in, uh, that was when I was 18 months old. I've been having a great time. Um, we are sort of moving to the Adirondack Park out of the New York City area on the five year plan. Um, and what this means in terms of where we are right now is David has a job in Manhattan and house school of books in Rosenville, which we're gradually moving out. But one of the reasons why it takes us five years to move is because David has at least 40,000 hardcover books. Um, I even thought it was more than that. It may be more than that. We haven't exactly got an inventory. Um, and anyway, so I, however, am living in Westport, New York, which is about two and a half hours south of Montreal, in a wonderful spot overlooking Montreal. And one of the really cool things about the Adirondack Park area where I live is that it's got a very high population of really interesting arts people. And so I'm like working my way through them and picking their brains. <laughs> and what I did last year and the year before is I was taking lessons from a landscape painter who let go that goes on hikes and so on. So I've gone on like our hikes where we pack up and we go and we take our materials and we sit and we look at the waterfall and we paint it. And, um, uh, but my, what, my, what I'm currently doing is um, working with a retired New York City theater director named Ted Cornell, who uh, he used to be 
um, affiliated with the New York Show and Shakespeare Festival and the public theater and so on. And um, he retired to the Adirondacks about 1990. And he, you know, raffled off time with him because he was looking for a student. He had reinvented himself as a painter and sculptor. And he decided he was going to get back into teaching and acting. And I am the but I'm not, it's not sort of, he's teaching acting, but what I'm getting out of it is something completely different. <laughs> so which, which is what, what is, is my reading this evening. What it is I'm reading is something that was built from the ground up to be read about, but it's not in science fiction. Um, and, um, so you're becoming an actress? Well, I'm, I think what I'm moving towards is a higher, as a book format whereby it's something built to be read. Not, not just built to be read, but built to do as a monologue, but uh, where, but it's, you know, but, but what, what the effect of this on the page is, is you can hear that voice. If you build it that way in the first place. So we're like meeting once a week for somewhere between two and five hours, last week it's five hours. And we just spend, you know, four or five hours of the workshop. And, you know, I, at, at the, I initially wanted to hold two hours, but he was having enough fun and then, about 20 hours, he said, I think you've run through your time. We need the shift over harder, so I'm doing our next so, anyway, so, so you'll be sort of like Spalding Gray, is that the thing? It's meant to be a monologue, you said. Well, actually, I, I, I hadn't heard of him, but he had pointed that out, and, and, and the swing of Cambodia, uh, it was like watching the clips of it on YouTube, and yeah, that's more or less the kind of thing. Um, I, don't, I don't wish to sit in a theater and do that sort of thing. I think what I would want to do is have a have something that can be in and out of performance, maybe with a podcast in the middle. Um, but it's a really interesting experience to take stuff of love on the page and then try to read it out loud. I mean, one of my favorite, I mean, we had, we had a year's best science fiction and a year's best fantasy, so I read lots and lots of short fiction and I have that opinion about what I thought was best. And one story that I thought was absolutely hands down the best story of this year, I tried to read it out loud. And the voice didn't work out of the page. <laughs> and so, um, and I started like looking at other things. And I just come to my attention that we get away with it. We let people get away with way too much in the third person. That who is the third person anyway? When you start trying to read it and you have you know, an age and a gender and so on, it, it really changes that. Well, I, when I do writing, and, and I know as in a writer's group where I was trying to say this about writing, and no one really understood what I said, when I said, well, when the third person is in the story, who's telling the story? Meaning that the, the, that something implies that someone is actually telling the story, even in the third person. You walk down the street, and you do this, you know, who's right. telling the story? Now, it's happening, and that's just sort of a way you do it. So I've used first person, second person, and so forth, but they didn't quite get the idea that that every story implies a teller, right. and you can use that in a way to part of the story as well. It's well, a different kind of layer. I'm a, I'm a strong advocate of using the third person for writing science fiction, because the problem with first person as a narrative as a narrative strategy for science fiction is that it's an evasive narrative <coughs> strategy, and that the first person doesn't tell you all kinds of things. It's great for detective fiction, where you can get to the end of the book and your first person narrator can reveal that, no, he himself is the serial killer. Uh, whereas in the third person, you know, the tip of the hand, you usually tip your hand a bit more. Um, but, and it's great for concealing information, um, but it's really tough for exposition. Um, and the second person has the down, I mean, has the difficulty that you have to get the reader to agree, and, and, and all of the, you know, the really best pieces of stuff in the second person, like Carlos Wood, his aura. Um, the trick is that by the end of the story, you can read all kinds of stuff you really shouldn't have. <laughs> well, my issue with the first person is often lazy, yes. but people often do it because it somehow seems easier. Oh, the story happens to me. I'll just tell what happens. Right. Uh, not thinking that many other questions have to be answered to successfully say the self the first person because just because you would use a certain word doesn't mean that this character that you've invented has the same vocabulary you have. That's one of the issues. So you're basically it's using like vocabulary up to your level of vocabulary when maybe it's an uneducated person or maybe it's a person meant to be more educated than you are, having to use language that you would never use if you go to research. Um, there, there are regionalisms that, that should be in there. If you're trying to have a certain person, the voice should be a certain kind of voice. So I think people often just sort of do it in a lazy way. And uh, 
However, the problem with the third person is I think my issue with writing off of this is that the same way you have default setting on a the computer, these are my margins, this is how many you know, lines of the page and so forth, is often a default setting when people think about how to create a story and they immediately just, oh, third person. Well, so rather than saying what fits this particular idea I'm trying to tell, is it the third person, is it the second, is it the first, is it past tense, is it whatever, yeah. and picking the right one, they sort of default to third person and past tense. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, I, I, I remain a strong advocate of the third person past tense for something telling science fiction. On the other hand, I, I, I think that third person needs to be much more heavily interrogated mm -hmm. than it is in fiction. Um, that would get rid of the way with way too much. Um, and when you have something where you are reading it aloud and you have to create inflections, it really changes the way. Now, the other thing with the first person is a lot of people don't factor in the fact that the, that the narrator is unreliable, meaning, meaning they're just assuming, oh, I'm just telling the story as it happened, not adding in the layer that the person telling it in the first person story may, A, not be aware of it, may be deliberately lying, may be misinterpreting things, and part of the fun of the story, when it's told in the first person, is for the reader to figure out, can I trust this? person telling me the story, or is the story really hidden, and part of enjoying the story is thinking, oh my god, this narrator, is, it's all wrong, I'm being entirely misdirected, and they're not getting what's really going on, I know better than the exact, but so a lot of the people who are lazy about the first person just tell the story, don't even think about it, oh, it's easy to be me, I'll react the way the character will react, I would react the way to the room and then the story, but you don't, you just sort of have the character being you, the author, again and again and again. Yeah, well, the other thing about this process we've been going through, which is, as I said, is very intensive, and I cannot imagine another circumstance under which, unless I had really a lot of money to blow on this, that I could get somebody else to put right. this much time into working on me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is, you know, that, that, but that having been said, what I'm getting out of it in addition to, uh, you know, a monologue, a, a monologue style first person narrative that I'm going to read at 10 o'clock tonight. Um, oh, you're actually going to oh, read it? Okay, well, I was just going to ask you, is there anything you can tell us about the content of this thing without spoiling it for you? Because you're going to be doing it, do an advertisement for it. Okay, the current working title, which changes in about every five minutes, um, is um, <coughs> Notes Towards the Liberation of Our Utopia. And it's a... Uh, it's about a jail-based utopia, a utopia with a jail-based economy in a Tea Party fusion. Um, based, and it's based on the Adirondack Park, correct? Right? Um, which actually is, in its way, a jail-based utopia. In that, um, the, it's, a, it's got like, the strictest environmental laws in the country, in the U.S. And um, it's got large tracts of forests that are designated for the wild, and there's all kinds of bad things to the environment that you're not allowed to do there. And the way the state of New York is, it's in the New York State Park. And the way New York State has funded it in large part, in, in terms of creating jobs so that people can live there, um, is they build lots of prisons there. Um, and uh, so there's this, you know, there's this population of people who live in this utopia who are in jail that we mostly don't think about, but they're there. And there's this big fight. Um, in, uh, in New York State right now, uh, in that the new governor wants to take, what wants to account those people who are in jail and living in the places where they came from, not where they are now, and uh, for, voting purposes. For, voting, for, for voting purposes, for districting purposes in terms of the population, and the you know the argument is over whether they are residents. Um, but you know, it's, so there's all, there's I mean, there's money money issues there political issues and so on, but if what happens is that, you know, what we see going on on, you know, the <laughs> CNN, et cetera, that I'm avoiding, that all kinds of things will no longer be funded, there will be these big empty buildings. And these big empty buildings, you know, with jail cells in them and set up and the top of them, but the area will still need to make money off of them. So I'm sort of jumping off of where things, from where things are now into uh, into jail privatization. Now, if you are not a government, but you need a jail, what do you need it for? 
and they sort of altered the law. They, mm -hmm. They've created an enterprise zone by suspending certain civil liberties to make it possible to do economically useful things with those jails. So that's what it's about. Okay, so you'll be performing this tonight yes, at 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock, and I have an hour long slot. Um, and, but uh, the other thing that, that I get out of this, um, and it's not something one set out to do, but when you sort of begin engaging as intensely as we have been with the issue of voice and performance of different texts, is I can hear the narrative voice much more intensely. In fact, the narrative voice will not shut up. <laughs> I have trouble getting enough sleep because it's like the narrative voice wants me to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and write somewhere. Um, and this is not an experience I've had before. I mean, one may notice, looking at my bibliography, that I've published really, really a lot more anthologies than, say, short stories. And the reason for that is, in my usual life, I have to be in real emotional and I'm finding that oh. this is not the case. So are you suggesting that we who want to read more of your things should try and create more emotional pain? No, I, 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 think, I think I should solve my problems and get over it and kind of write it. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> well, there will be the saner <laughs> way to, to do it. But, but so it's a, it's an, you know, this is, the, this is what I've been doing. Mm. And also I've been painting a lot and take, and, and uh, those of you who might follow my Flickr stream or, or, or my, uh, the recent incarnation of my blog, or indeed me on Facebook, will notice that I also take lots and lots and lots of pictures of my pretty view. <laughs> uh, and so I get up many mornings and take pictures of the sunrise and post them on the internet. Yeah. So that, what else? Well, it's funny, you're talking about acting, reminds me of something I don't think I've spoken of uh, about much at conventions or anything, is why I'm a writer instead of an actor. That I, because I did a lot of acting in high school and college and uh, local repertory companies and so forth, and basically decided that rejection was easier to take for a writer. Uh, that's why is one. That? That's one of many. One of two reasons I, I, why. I don't, I, know, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> look at look at this way. You write a story. You put it in the mail. Well, in the pre-internet days, you put it in the mail and you wait it. And by the time the story is rejected, you have already figured out that it's damn well going to be rejected. You found all the flaws in it, and you sort of given up on it before the editor has even responded and said, "Oh, you know, blah blah blah." They're not going to want it now. An actor, on the other hand, an actor gets up on the stage, is delivering the monologue, is filled with confidence, and in the middle of a word, the director says, "Next," and shuts you down right in the middle of it. That, so basically, you are being rejected to your face in the middle of the performance and told, get out, time for the next person. So two, uh -huh. two different, that's one reason, two different levels of rejection. I thought, do I really want to go? I think I'd rather have them do it by my do, yeah, do you really want to go day <laughs> after day and do that in front of someone? And you, you would be out there, the director and the, the writer, and say, no, Meg, and you haven't even finished. You're all excited, you're in the middle of the character. And I thought, it's easier to put it in the mail. That's one thing, the level of rejection. The other thing is that you have the freedom. No one has control over you as a writer from the artistic point of view. In writing, generally, it's art first, business later. In acting, it's got to be business first, art later. Depending on what uh, role you're fulfilling within the you know, life cycle of, of acting. So let's say I want to be an actor. I can do all the monologues I want alone in my room in front of a mirror. And until a director says, okay, we've got a stage, we've got a script, we've got a theater, we're going to sell tickets, we've got an audience, it gives you permission to do your art, unless you're just going to do a guerrilla play with some of your friends on the street that you just start doing on a street corner. You need permission to do your art. For a writer, you can finish your story. It might be 20 years before someone buys it. You know, it might, you'll have that long haul of being rejected, but the art part of it is finished. So no one is controlling whether you can do your art or not. And I, basically, I did, not want to be, I did not want to be in a position the way I have this friend of mine who wanted to be an actor. Well, A, first of all, you got to have jobs that allow you to take off and spend every day. That's why so many actors, I don't think they're waiters because they want to be waiters, you know? People, people have that kind of job because, I, sorry, i got to take a day off. i got to go to this audition and that audition and so forth. 
Uh, so basically, I did not want to can that much control of my artistic life to someone else. Well, then don't but, be an anthologist because that's Well, yeah, well, an anthologist, yeah, that's different. Yeah. You're, then you're then, the business, you get the idea and then the business first, right. art well, second. I, mean, I wanted to just do the art and okay, it'll happen, it'll not happen, but at least I can say this is finished. Well, I mean, um, being somebody who edits anthologies with David Hartwell has its good sides and its bad sides. And its bad side is that nobody wants a book edited just by me. If they, if they think they can find a way to get David uh -huh. to, um, they want David to. And um, I spent, I mean, we wouldn't know this from the bibliography because the time is a very Contracts being there. But I spent 10 years after you know winning a World Fantasy Award and so on trying to sell anthologies alone and failed. Dead failed. I said, okay, I give up. I'll go back to editing the anthologies with David. We had a contract in two weeks. And uh, I'm about to try it again. And I think this time it's going to work. Um, but you, I mean, you have this great idea. And there's this temptation to say, well, maybe I could just do it on my credit card. Maybe I could just do a book that's so good that they have to buy it, and I'll just pay really high. Oh, I see. So you'll buy the stories first yeah, and show yeah. up and with a completely finished. Yeah, and it's so finished. tempting. And it's like, no, you do anthologies on other people's money. Well, there's always well, Kickstarter. Yeah. Well, that's true. That was my, I call that Edelman's first rule of publishing, because the first magazine I published, a semi-pro magazine, and lost $20,000 Okay, rule number one of publishing is use somebody else's money. Well, I mean, my advantage in this is that I married somebody who insists on break even uselessly in small press projects. We do not do a small press project unless we're going to know how to make it break even. And we actually make a small profit on the New York New York Science Fiction, believe it or not. Very small, but it's always in the black. Um, so, unless I can explain how. Can, can actually at least break even. I can't do it, but but see, I you know I could have happily wandered off and, and right. done forty or sixty thousand dollars worth of damage doing my own. True. Place. Well, anthologies are. I mean, I attempted to sell a couple of anthologies, all of which have been turned down, and it can be heartbreaking because I I was doing one. I had the idea it was the 100th anniversary of the, the invention of equals MC squared, and I mm -hmm. thought that would make a, a good anthology, and I got. Uh, Jack Williamson agreed to write a story, Fred Cole agreed to write a story, Connie Willis agreed to write a story, Jim Morrow agreed to write a story. I mean, basically I had a solid dozen people who you think their names would be meaningful. And it got uh, rejected by all but uh, one publisher who thought, oh, maybe we can get some scientists to also do some things and have it be a combined science fiction and science one. And that got passed. And then the sad part of that is well, some writers say yes and forget about it. And, you know, meaning, meaning, I don't mean they say yes, and then when you say I've sold the anthology, they say, what, I have to write a story? I mean, some writers you say, do you want in on this? And then they don't think about it until you fall and say, I've sold it. But other writers, they were contacting me, anxious to write the story. So when you have Jack Williamson say, oh, I really want to write the, you know, the story. Or, and Jim Mara says, oh, what's going on with that, uh, with that anthology? I want to write that story. That, that's when you say, oh, my god, I really feel terrible. I, you know, no, nobody. Yeah, I thought that would be a saleable one, not just within the science fiction, but could get some traction outside. This was now, whatever, however many years this was ago, 10, whatever years ago. But my, anyway, best, yeah, was, my best book that never was, and this was uh, when I was in graduate school at Columbia, was going to be a collaboration, original anthology, co edited with Jack Zipes of Utopian Fairy Tales. And that would have been mm. such a good book. Um, but, yeah. You know, the other one that I was trying to sell, I was trying to sell a uh, wrestling anthology. Because, get that, this is a, a weird, so when I was having science fiction age, I would do anything to keep that magazine alive. And at one point, the publisher came to me and said, do you think you can edit a wrestling magazine? And my theory was, the more money I made on other projects, the less I paid attention to the one that wasn't as profitable. Because they sort of, well, we're not losing money on it. So but let's keep him happy because he does all this other stuff. Anyway, I ended up doing this wrestling magazine. And who knew that so many science fiction, fantasy, and horror writers were major wrestling fans? They all wanted to write for me. Pat Kagan, major wrestling fan. Kim Newman, major wrestling fan. Doug Winter, they're all, they're insane. Uh, Dennis Etchison, they're all crazy. I mean, not just 
oh, I like wrestling now and again. It's like, when is WrestleMania on? I mean, Dan Sessions was pissed. We were at the World Bar Con last year in Brighton, and he couldn't find a sports bar playing WrestleMania. And it was going on, like, he was desperate. He was you know, going through withdrawal symptoms. So there are all of these people who are known science fiction fans in the hardware. And I thought I could sell, I, I contacted Marty Greenberg and said, look, I've got a dozen, at Craig Shore Gardner, major, all these people were writing for this wrestling magazine. They should have bought that. And I said, you know, call it Wrestling with the Star, or something, I don't know, whatever the name we had was. Sure. You know, and they all said, okay, I'm in, I love to write a wrestling, a science fiction fantasy or horror story, and he said he couldn't sell that. And I thought, at the time, I was editing a wrestling magazine, and which actually got reviewed as a wrestling magazine in the Washington Post, did a roundup of wrestling magazines, and they called it, you know, the best wrestling magazine, the best written wrestling magazine being published, which had all these folks who were good writers, and it wasn't uh, over-intellectualized stuff. They really loved wrestling, and so couldn't sell that one either, so. Oh, it occurs to me there was a tale, I should probably tell. How are we doing for time, by the way? 11.30. 11.30, uh, okay. Um, people may perhaps be wondering what happened to our year's best fantasy series. <laughs> the truth is much stranger than you might think. Uh, the, the, the missing volume that didn't come out last year may yet be published. In fact, we have a contract. We're not done negotiating. But, um, so we moved the series to Tor.com, uh, and we were sort of their guinea pig for electronic publishing things. Um, and it was in that, the, that year's, I guess it was year's best SF9, um, was the first book to be published by Tor.com, Core.com is really a separate entity and has its own separate existence from, from Tor within the Macmillan thing. And there's different people that get asked about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And the company's really happy with Tor.com because it's sort of like they're in a kind of, at least, pop, they're, they're, they're exploring the future of publishing in a way that the corporation itself um, is very happy with. Um, also, I think it probably gets their attention that it was mostly Tor.com. Tor who really went to bat for the USA and Amazon thing uh -huh. and kept getting you know, quoted in the press. So anyway, Tor.com has the ability to do weird projects, but they're trying to figure out how to do them. And so we were where they started. And our year's best SF9 was initially conceived of as a book that was primarily electronic, that was going to have a POD thing for people who really insisted that they actually would but, well, what sold was the POD, and there's all kinds of um, interesting adventures that I sh stories I shouldn't tell, but I am amazed that books survived as a matter of publication because there's all kinds of things that you know experiences that you get when you don't get what you want. There's a lot of things that went wrong. But now this came out in 2010 as the best of 2009. No, no, that came out that, that came out on schedule more or less. No, no, it was about six months late, but that came out in the year it was supposed to. Okay, so here's best SF10, which is supposed to cover not 2010, but 2009. Okay. It isn't out yet. But we have a contract, and the contract spent a very long time in discussion in which uh, new possible ways of doing sort of digital book hybrids were tossed up in the air, and, and proposals were put forth. And we would say, but you can't do that as a print book. And I'd say, oh, OK, well, let's go back to that. You know, they sort of figure out what the optimal electronic version was and realize the print book could not possibly exist. And so there was a long negotiation. And then, the, and then when we were all done with that to, the, to a certain point, then Macmillan USA utterly revolutionized its contract and had to go back to the contracts to work. So now we have a contract. Uh, we're going to do the previous year's book, ah, yeah. and it's going to, we're, we're, we're actually getting paid a lot more for it than the previous one, too, which is part of the reason for enduring this pain. Um, but it's going to be maybe at least 50% longer, maybe twice as, twice as long as the previous now, without sharing the actual sales numbers, you said that the uh, POD outsold the digital. Can you give us a ratio of like how no. much is it? No, 
they don't have a royalty department for Tor.com yet. <laughs> Why not? Did the digital ads sold in two one or just a little bit more? Okay. Yeah, one of those little issues is that, well, at some point, guys, you have to give us a royalty statement. Oh, okay. so, tell you about, so, uh, yeah, yeah, in terms of negotiations of what, how they wanted to tweak this process, certain pieces of information have been given to us. Um, we're not talking big bucks in terms of total numbers, but the way things worked out turned out and had a very different pattern than they expected. Are, are, are royalty rates different between the online version and the POD? I don't remember what the what the details of that were. I mean, uh, so the whole business model, ten million. It's a. It's it will it will be interesting to see if it works and if what I'm trying to do once we get through this contract negotiation um, is to then hit them with a couple more projects and say, hey, let's just do it on the same terms. Can we just do it, you know, can I, I, I this, this reprint anthology and this original anthology, can you just give me a contract for these right now on exactly those terms? That's what I want to do. Um, so the model will see how it runs for a little bit. Well, I'm, I want to, if I can sell these books, I just want to do books, you know. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I, I should say that I, I, I should, I should care about money more than I do, but what you're taking, I mean, it's the issue of getting permission to do your art. I have a moment where, you know, these are not my ideal terms, because nothing, I mean, well, I'm not going to get out my ideal terms as an anthologist in 2011, no matter what. Um, but um, I want to do books. And the other thing is, you know, much as my husband is a, a, a beautiful and lovely collaborator, he's also pushing 70. And at a certain point, I have to be able to do books by myself, and I had better start now. Well, one thing about it, I have a couple of projects that have gone digital as well, and luckily, since I am not doing any of my books, luckily or unluckily, I mean, unluckily, everything that I publish is occurring through small press. Luckily, that means that you're not dealing with very, uh, you know, ornate contracts and, and rights grabs in terms of the digital rights. So if you're going with PS Publishing and have my collection of uh, all my zombie stories in one place, what we come after, uh, was a hardcover book that came out last year, and he's just started going digital, has put out a digital edition, and the good thing about it, someone came up to me at the convention and said, oh, I just downloaded your book to my Kindle. Uh, not necessarily because, uh, I don't know, he wanted it over one over the other, but small press books are pretty hard to find often. I've discovered that, that you know, I will go somewhere and no dealer will have any PS publishing publications. And if I bring copies, they, they all sell out. Like I, I brought uh, seven or eight copies of the, the book to the World Con in Australia, and they all sold. And the dealer said, well, why didn't you bring more of them? And said, well, you can order them from, because, but they don't want to pay the postage overseas and so forth. So a lot of these things are hard to get. But the fact that it's digital, and you can just download off the Kindle, uh, or whatever your device happens to be, uh, makes it easier. Of course, my son, the, the future generation, is saying, why isn't everything electronic? Nobody wants to buy a book anymore. You know, you should be having more free stuff on there. You know, that's, how, that's what we want. We want now. We want to be able to press a button and get it. That's a whole other issue about book love and bibliophilia. But, uh, yeah, I, I but I'm glad that there, there are some things out there to allow the people who want to do that to make it easier. Because that's sort of painful. To pe the PS Publishing books are beautifully produced beautiful artwork, um, and they're hard to get unless you have a super dedicated local book dealer. I mean, you can order them directly from the publisher, but a lot of people want to go into the dealer's room and buy it and go get autographed and so forth. So I'm glad that that's becoming uh, available, at least that particular book. Yeah, well, uh, my day job, in as much as I have one, um, is uh, I'm, uh, I work for, well, I, I, I have two consulting contracts. One, I'm, I'm a uh, a social media consultant for local research, but um, when I actually go into an office, um, uh, I do it a couple of times with the governor for um, like Curry, um, when I work with that Curry books. So um, right now I'm like helping catalog early 20th century utopias, which feeds into what. Yeah, so I'm getting this, yeah well, anything is I've got this sort of huge exposure to all kinds of bad ideas that were around in the early 20th. 20th century, where people were really willing to put their, you know, put put, put it on the line and tell you what they thought the world would be. Whereas now they write dystopian.
utopias, because that's a much safe, safer thing, thing to do, because there's so many ways to jump the shark in, in, in a utopia. Um, but so I go in there and, and like research this obscure stuff, and then I go home and consider the problem of utopia. Yeah. But you know, but we're like, you know, never mind the same point. It's you know, I'm opening it very, very carefully because it costs seven hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> Well, that's the one thing I like about Google Books is go and get the old public domain stuff. You know, we, I like being able to go grab the uh, dictionary of slang from 1840 or something like that, rather than having to. I, I, use I love the smell yeah. of the books and I like getting them, but the fact that they can be instantaneously available to me. Uh, I, 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 I make very heavy use of Google Books in this kind of stuff, but um, um, it's pretty frustrating experience to work with that um, in comparison to having the actual book. But then you, but you don't have to worry about breaking. The I know. That's, I mean, <laughs> I love one of the, when I go to the bookshops, I usually go and look for bound volumes of old magazines. Uh -huh. So I have, you know, Harper's from the 1890s or Frank Leslie's Weekly and things like that. That's what I find fascinating. I like looking at the latest scientific discoveries um, of, of an earlier day. I remember there was one article on the coming age of electricity. And they were talking about, will the electron someday, it, oh, it's, it, it's a myth. It's very controversial to teach this theory in colleges and universities. And they're wondering if it will someday be like a you know, philosophy, that you know, the electron will be proven to be this mythical thing that doesn't really exist. And should, you know, should we be teaching it to our children and that kind of thing? So uh, you know, reading stuff like that uh, of, of a certain period yeah. And, oh, and what are these meteorites? Uh, oh, what, what, I know, there's some uh, discussion with, um, with some peasants who said they saw stones falling from the sky, and they're peasants, you know, <laughs> we don't believe that where these rocks came from, they're telling us they actually fell out of the sky, aren't they ridiculous? So, you know, reading this, this stuff from an earlier age, the science stuff is just magnificent. So I love uh, going when I go to a bookstore trying to find some of those things, but the fact that all these old magazines are available, uh, in fact, before getting on the plane to go to the Worldcon in Australia, I downloaded early copies of Astounding mm -hmm. from the 30s mm -hmm. on my iPad, and I'm sitting there flying to Australia reading 80-year-old you know, stories, and it was just wonderful to say, wow, who would have ever thought of this going on to you know, be able to do this? And it was just there. I wouldn't have to track the magazines down. Well, I mean, in terms of it in general, what I mean, David showed me in a, in a, in a, the, an issue of Publisher this week and he was talking about sort of ballpark sales figures for various you know, e titles. And first of all, the whole ball of wax looked a whole lot smaller than the hype. Um, and just in terms, if you, if you add up all the various figures of everything that's selling, it's, it's a lot smaller than it maybe should be. Um, but secondly, you know, I'm looking down these lists of books that sell a lot in e copies, and it just seems to me these are really my book and most part not my audience. It's not that my audience doesn't read electronic books, but rather the mass audience for electronic books has very few tangencies with the world I, the, the literary world I know, um, in terms of the big numbers. Yeah. Well, I don't think of myself as writing for a mass audience. If I ever had a mass audience, it would be something wrong with the world. It would be some major accident. I, mean, I sort of think of myself as writing for my circle of friends or something, the people who are like me kind of thing. So, I mean, I write what I want to write, and then I hope that it somehow finds a market. And uh, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was on a panel with Steve Jones and uh, talking about zombies, and he took my, uh, the title story from my collection, What Will Come After, was the only original story. So it's all reprint of all my zombie stories, and that one was an original one. And he chose to reprint it as the lead story in Best New Horror uh, you know, this year. And it suddenly struck me when he did that, he made the purchase last week, that I have a much better ballpark uh, batting average with British editors than I do with American editors. <coughs> go through all my sales, I've sold away eight short stories, and the, the two editors who have been the nicest to me, and who mm -hmm. bought most from me, are Steve Jones and Pete Crowder. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you put the two of them together, I think they've purchased almost 20 stories mm -hmm. from me. Put them, and then when you add in you know, other uh, people, like, uh, I guess, uh, George, George Mann is British, isn't he? It's the largest book of it. 
no, Australian. He's, I think he's British. But you know, he's bought stories from me, and so it's fascinating that um, you know, in the U.S., I haven't, I feel, you know, made that much of a breakthrough through the higher level, uh, you know, markets. Hey, I've been submitting the fancy science fiction since 19, the mid, uh, the, you know, the late uh, 60s when I was 13, and I've never sold the story. This persistence for you, I think, I got a story about every three or four months out of it, uh, because I know it's about the story. It's not about me. Someday something might click. Who knows? Uh, same thing with Asimov. I've been uh, sending stories to Asimov since the magazine came out, getting rejections all along. I did sell on my sonnet, though, uh, along the way. But uh, in the UK, there's something about, you know, the way, uh, I remember when I went to uh, London early on, they said, what's this Monty Python thing? Oh, no, you guys wouldn't understand that. That's just sort of a British taste. Well, we ended up liking it anyway. That's a different story. but. So I was trying to analyze what is it about my writing that is appealing to Pete Crowther and Steve Jones and the British kind of you know audience, which I don't have the answer to that. Like you know, but it's certainly this latest sale of the Steve too hard, this latest Steve Jones. Well, it's sort of I didn't know if there was anything there or it's just some kind of coincidental accident that uh, you know a couple of Brits respond have that responsiveness to the stories. Uh, right. What you doing with some friends? Uh, did you say France? What? It's, like, it's like Jerry Lewis and France. Oh, Jerry Lewis and France. Yeah, so, so, so you're yeah. telling me that I am the Jerry Lewis of science fiction? Or even. Is that what it is? Or horror? I thought it was Amy Ben Hood. Okay. No, I have one project that I've been pursuing that is completely non sequitur to the rest. Okay. So we are living there in the Outer on Deck Park. And John, David and I jointly with my parents bought an orchard. Have um, three miles south of my house, seven acres with 246 apples. Wait, now haven't you already bought a bed and breakfast or something? No. Don't you have a bed or book? No. You have yeah, a no, bookshop. No, you know, no my house has a built in bookstore, but that's another story. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, guess I, thought you were <laughs> I think that says a lot about my relationship with my husband that my house is a built in bookstore. But anyway, so we have this orchard um, uh, three miles south of my house. And um, I found myself abruptly running it last April, things sort of, you know, I, I, which was sort of unforeseen. Um, and uh, this year we're doing a trial of Japanese fruit bags, um, which is, the, the Japanese have this method of raising apples where there are these bags that are about this big that are sort of uh, paper on the outside and then wax, red wax paper on the inside and they've got a little built-in twist and tie and they've got these vents on the bottom. And you, you you, there's an applet, and it's about the size of a dime. You pop off all the applets around it, and you attach this to the branch. And then three weeks before harvest, you take these off, and the apples will have been protected and be in pretty good shape. But they're albino because they've not been exposed to light. Well, what you can do at that moment is stencil them. If you can put a stencil on there that blocks the light, and so you can put like text or images on the apples. Hmm. And my wild idea that we're about to try and I, you know, is that we're going to do these art amp apples as a community art project. And with some great difficulty, I just ordered 5,000 bags from Japan. Has anyone ever done this before? The well, the, um, I mean, the, the stenciling part of it, not the protective aspect of it. Yes, but not as a community project. Not as a let's have a party and put bags on the trees, and then let's have a party and we can all get together and, and put the stencils and I was <laughs> come on and put the stencils on the on the apples and such. Um, and uh, <laughs> oh, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't we'll pretend you've been here all along. Seriously, I want to speak to what's the next podcast? Well. <laughs> Well, I've got an idea. I mean, now is it, you can actually stencil words on these apples. Well, I mean, does that mean that I can I can write a story on the apples and yeah, you can put you a different word? Yeah, you have to have a narrative strategy where you could deal with the fact that some of the apples are going to fall off the trees. Your story would still have to make sense. Um, so. Well, you have to have multiple editions of the story. So, see, you could do well, the same I'll, word on three or four different apples. So. You have two hundred forty-six trees now. The, the, okay. the getting all the bag with you. Now, getting all the bags from Japan was kind of an adventure because I'd like done the research on this in January and figured out I wanted to do this, but I had I'd say yeah and I'll get around to it later. 
Then there was this earthquake. <laughs> and I said, oh no. Never mind that I, earthquakes are terrible things. I know in intense detail how bad it is in an earthquake zone because I did a lot of work on the Pakistan earthquake trying to do disaster relief and also on Hurricane Katrina. But also from the perspective of my Apple project, it's like, okay, northern Japan, where do they grow apples in Japan? They grow them in northern Japan. Where do they make the bags? Northern Japan. Luckily, the factory is on the other side. The other side. Mm -hmm. and then I found out that um, Federal Express wanted $900 to get 66 pounds of apple bags to me from, from, uh, from, uh, from northern Japan. And and there are no U.S. manufacturers or anything else that no, will is, do the is, job. This is only made. Yeah. These are only made in Japan. And their shipper wanted four hundred fifty dollars, and I was, and then I started looking into freight forwarding and so on. And I'm not sure what we're doing for next year. First of all, we got to find out if this works. But I have this wild idea that that maybe what we'll do is cut a deal with Japanese fans and that they bring my happy bags to the world. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can get lots of money for the party. Yeah, I can just see the Japanese fans going through customs in, uh, well, in Torino and they're saying, why do you have 5,000 paper bags? Paper they're paper just bags. paper bags. Well, the ones we ordered were just paper bags. The ones that I, you know, they have a whole bunch, this is a very advanced technology with all kinds of details. So that some of the bags that you can buy appear to involve having pesticides, pre, being pre treated with pesticides. But that, that seems like something that would be likely to not be confiscated at the border. So you know, oh, the reference is that Japanese consider food. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, what they do with apples, so that they're these beautiful, perfect things that you bring so, as a gift, yeah. that food is extremely expensive uh, you know, over there. The apples are just perfect because you know, no right. so sunlight, no bugs, and no birds are pecking mm -hmm. them to get the birds. Oh, they can. Well, we were staying at a hotel. This is funny. Uh, when we were going for the Japanese World Con, and the hotel every day put out nine apples on a bowl next to the elevator on our floor. And we would go every day as we headed out and take one of the apples. And they would told us how happy they were that we took them because no one else would take the apples because they were so perfect. And the, the three by three configuration was so wonderful that the Japanese who were in this hotel You're would not, even though they were expensive, yeah. would not take them because they were just so perfect. And they said, "Oh, we're so glad that you, you know, you're taking these." So we're examples. trying to we're trying this in Westport, New York, and we get to find out what the print re resolution of apples is. And when I uttered that sentence, somebody thought I was talking about a computer <laughs> the screen resolution. No, I mean, what can what what size of words can you read when you stencil it on the side of an actual apple? <laughs> Anyway, that's my, my uh, that, Well, I find that fascinating because I could see writing a story to be published on apples. Um, <laughs> and then you can take pictures of it on Flickr and then you put it, you know. Or you wouldn't, or you would See, that's, I mean, there are a number of authors who you may be aware or not be aware of have written stories designed to the ball. I mean, did William Gibson, did, uh, didn't he do a story? Yeah, that, yeah. That, 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 I mean, they read a story designed months. to be eaten. Uh, I, know Mike, I know Michael Swanwick has written a couple of stories that he sealed in a bottle with uh -huh. wax, and if you open yeah, it and read the story, story it's destroyed the story. I mean, basically, part of the art creation is the fact that the story is in a scroll rolled up in there, and you have no idea what the story is. I, know, I hear people. I hear applause in the next room. Okay, that my, my reading. Yeah, about six minutes. Okay. Well, my, my uh, reading of uh, notes towards the, in the in the liberation of our utopia is at ten p.m. Stamina. And I will be reading uh, my story called uh, The Only Wish Ever to Come True tomorrow at noon, I believe. And for those who want to get copies of my PS publishing book that I think it's so hard to find, I did look a few from the States, so if you track me down at the autograph session later, I'll have a, uh, a few that maybe you can persuade me to sell you. Any? And what I am reading at 9 p.m. <laughs> if I, if I <laughs> Last question? Yeah, um, just kind of a, an observation and, and perhaps a couple minutes is fine to uh, respond to, but looking at the, the electronic world, uh, looking at major stakeholders, publishers, editors, writers, audience, right? Is that I've begun to think that the real value points are actually going to be the editors. 
I find that when I read, because there's so much now that's e-published and self-published, and I'm getting tired of it very quickly because it's such a crapshoot as to whether it's a good book or not. And now the commodity to me isn't the money, it's the time. And how much time do I want to invest in something right, that I get into? And again, I don't like it. What I'm finding is that the editing of a lot of self-published stuff is just awful, right? And I think that the value that publishers are going to bring to the table is quality selectors when I go to Tor or DAW or whatever publisher I like, I can develop an expectation of what I'm going to get from that and, and an expectation around editing as well. We, we certainly value editing in my house. <laughs> that, that could be a whole panel on that. But yeah, the self-publishing and e-publishing are not the same thing, other than except the fact that e-publishing yes. has made self-publishing easier. But there's well, always yeah. been vanity press, and there's always been the slush pile. That, it's, the slush more, pile has now been made more visible. Well, that's exactly it. They're, they're accessible. I guess, I guess you know, there, there's, a, there's a kind of question implied in what you're saying, which is, you know, what, where do we go from here? Where do you build your value? And and I, 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 I think, in, I mean, and I certainly agree with you that editing, but it's a very self serving point of view, thing for an, from, a, from an editor to say. Um, but my own strategy is that exactly the process I'm talking about, about getting involved in the other arts and see how they interact with your writing. If I want to know about setting, I'm going to learn landscape painting, go hiking with the paints. If I want to learn about character, I work with a the theater director. And um, I'm trying to explore my explore in that direction, and I think it's making, certainly for me, it's being tremendously productive in terms of fiction and, you know, in terms of what I'm doing right now. I don't know if I can sustain this, but um, right now it's working real well. But, I, but part of what I have in mind is what is the book after the app bubble collapses? Because the, public, the, the, the device manufacturers are not going to promote the idea that people ought to read on, on screen forever and ever. Eventually, they're going to figure out what these devices are for, and they're going to market them for that. And it may not be about us. We may be just collateral damage. Um, so I, what I'm thinking of is what I think I would like the book to be about, and it, has involved, and it involves crossing art, artistic boundaries. Okay. And now we must yield to the next group here. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>